better explain it to you. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. I'm going to get with him. Okay, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the September 13th. Yep, wait, what? Mike. Your mic, your mic. Ladies and gentlemen, okay, we're going to get this right. You do the. Welcome to the September 13th, 2022 meeting of the Public Works Committee. Um, we call a meeting of order, and our council member, our committee members are Council Member Barbara Haynes Burke, Vice Chair, Council Member John Larson, Council Member Annette Scipio, and myself, Jeff McIntosh. As is typical, we have items on our consent and our general agenda. Um, we have four items on the consent agenda. Two of the first two of which were passed unanimously at finance yesterday. Um, are there, there are there any of the consent agenda items that we would want to have pulled? Uh, C1, just for information. C1 for inf information. Anyone else? <clears throat> C3. I'm sorry. C3. C3. Okay, C1 and C3. Could I get a motion to approve the balance? So move. Second. We get the opportunity to vote. It's not coming up. It didn't come up. Okay. Are, are they joined, Jane, Dana? Have they all joined? Should we do a voice vote? Mm -hmm. All else fails. Yep. Voice vote. Sandy's going to get us here. Is it up? Okay. Um, if I would hear ayes in favor. Aye. Oh, there it comes. Here we go. Oh, here it is. Now. There we go. Thank you, Sandy. Okay, that's unanimous. Now, if we could have C1, please. Item C1, consideration of items relating to the first and second streets two-way conversion project. Thank you. We have Mr. Fansler to uh, brief us on this quickly. Uh, Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, I, I would just like a briefing on the total conversion project where we are. Okay. Okay. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. Good uh, my name is Jeff Fansler, Deputy Director of the Department of Transportation. And uh, Council Member Scipio, to answer your question directly, um, if you look outside this building, you notice there are some paving equipment that is stationed right outside on the, uh, on the first street side. So we made it. <laughs> No, I appreciate the, the patience and the commitment from this body to, to work with us on this. You know, we've dealt with a lot of delays. I've mentioned that at, at updates in the past. We've dealt with a lot of challenges on this project. Um, but the good thing I think that we had is a, a contractor in this day and time that was willing to work with us. So I will publicly say that it has been a good relationship. We're trying to get a lot of things. The nuances of this project are very unique. Um, but long story short, we do plan to start paving this week. Actually, we've been told, and, and um, I, I, I'm notorious for for weather delays and you know what i think may happen doesn't always happen in this field but we are expected to start put, laying asphalt uh today or uh, excuse me tomorrow or the next day uh just depending on material availability when the trucks arriving and 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 getting their crews on board with the asphalt plant and all those nuances so uh we'll start paving we'll start down here at this end and when i say this end it's the eastern end around here on this end of first street and we'll work out <laughs> towards the ballpark and, and that'll go on for several days. So bear with us. There'll be a, some growing pains here. There'll be some traffic congestion, uh, but we'll work through it. At the same time, we'll be doing some other side work on 2nd Street. So we can, when we finish 1st Street, we'll jump over there and do some work. All this is ongoing signal work as well. So just a lot of moving pieces, a lot of nuances. I keep saying that word because it's just a lot to deal with. But bear with us, and we'll work through it. So I'm happy to answer any further questions about the project or this item, but I appreciate your time. Does it look like we'll be complete by the end of September? So the answer to that question, complete with the project, no, because the traffic signal work will, will take some time still yet, but we will have a significant piece of the, of the paving done by September. That is the goal. Anything else? <clears throat> I'm very much looking forward to getting rid of the longest speed bump in Winston-Salem. <laughs> <laughs> we echo that. <laughs> Amen. Great. Can I get a motion on that, please? I move for approval of C1. Thank you. A second. A motion and a second. Us up. Okay, can we have item C3, please? Item C3, resolution approving encroachment agreement with Flock Safety for installation of automated license plate readers. 
Mayor T Pro Tem asked for this to be pulled. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair McIntosh. And I apologize uh, for asking this to be pulled. But um, <clears throat> maybe it's for the city manager to answer it. Or, or Ms. Tony, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> I don't see any cost in this. So <clears throat> I know it was came to public safety in March. And... And it's going to council. What are we voting on? I mean, we are voting to do it, but I think it's it doesn't have a price tag with it. Was that the intent? Good evening, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Adams, members of the committee. Good evening. Yes, th this is a pilot project, and so uh, it does not come with the cost um, through the pilot period. So. You all are not approving the pilot. Uh, the information item was given to public safety back in March, just so you all are aware. Um, the city attorney also sent just some concerns from ACLU, just so you all are aware of that as well. Tonight, you all are voting on an encroachment agreement that then allows these cameras to be installed in the city's right of way. <clears throat> Excuse me, so we checked all the boxes, uh, city attorney with the ACLU and other groups that could see this as a problem maybe? What do you, I mean, I'm just asking. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Adams, if you may recall, I kind of set forth some of the concerns that were expressed by the ACLU in my memo the other day, um, and I'll refer you to those items. I think the draft that was presented back in uh, March in terms of uh, the pilot program is probably the best that we can come up with uh, in the event the city wants to move forward with the project. <clears throat> so the pilot program is the map that they showed us or is it a, a variation of that map? The map shows what, 24? I think the map shows the locations for the uh, installation of the license plate readers. Mm -hmm. So is this, and maybe I need to ask Ms. Tony, is this one per number, sheet number, or two? It's, what is it? It should be two equally per ward. Okay. And this is a pilot. It, I'm going to lean on the attorney. I just me, don't. I'm only referring to what staff has indicated. Yes, it's my understanding as a pilot. I think the pilot period is. 12 months, if I recall it's a correctly. 12 month pilot period. Um, I, I will say that other surrounding communities have this as well Kernersville, Charlotte, Greensboro, Raleigh. Um, Greensboro is just adding additional ones. But yes, Assistant Chief Penn is here. He can answer a few more questions. All I want to know, and again, maybe I, I missed it in the reading of this, what does the community feel about this? particularly my urban inner city community about this, my black and brown community about this. Have we asked them? Did we tell them we're getting ready to do this? Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Chairman McIntosh, members of the committee. So part of this program, there is a transparency piece that once we get up and running, um, it will be on the website. We are going to educate the public on, during the public safety news conference and allow let them know what's going on. And, and that's part of the recommendations from the ACLU that we will follow. So when we do this news conference, we're not going to do it the day we're going to flip the switch, are we? I mean, if whatever timeline you, 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 that you all have, you need to back it up and give the public an opportunity to digest what you're getting ready to do. Because there are some people that are uncomfortable about people taking license plate pictures or anything else, and they see it, and I know the journey, privacy, and all of that. I don't want us to miss an opportunity to do something proactively good, but we've all learned now over the past three or four years, if we don't let the public know when we're thinking about doing this, and, and to have a, a number, uh, a, a email, a website, or something that they can send in and, and, and say something. And then when you bring it and say, we're getting ready to do it, you can tell the public. We put out a survey. We asked the public to give us some communication, and everything came back. We had maybe 1%, 2% that didn't agree with it. 
Are they, is that what we're doing? Yes, ma'am. We can absolutely do that. I think we need to do that, uh, Chief Penn. Can, Thank you very much. Can I make a suggestion? It might be good for that campaign to start before we put the other pieces in place. Do you mind holding this item in committee for another 30 days so we can make sure we do that process correctly? I, I think we need to do that. I just sometimes over the past three or four years, or I've been on this council 13. I've seen when we've had challenging situations and things that happen, uh, like in 2009 when uh, Councilmember Taylor Montgomery and myself were held up, I call it hostage, at a meeting of the community because we didn't tell them, and the ACLU got involved, of uh, us trying to stop. Uh, some of the drive-through violence that was going on in our community, the numbers were extremely high, the home invasions. And to the public, the thing that made them, I think, more upset with us than they told us was we didn't tell them. We just started stopping cars and frisking and, and you know, you, you're police, you know how this goes. And we could have done it better. And I believe we've learned over the past three or four years if we just... Be transparent. Let them help us with policy making and decisions we make. Then if they get mad at us, they're not so mad at us, but they can at least understand why we're doing it and the fact that we ask them, hey, what do you think about this? And when you go public with your news conference, you'll be able to say that we did that. Is that, all, is that okay with everybody? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, this is not a... a this is not a time sensitive matter. Um, it, it, we can implement this about any point. I do think we can hold it in committee until the police department or whoever is bringing forward can, was ready to bring it back. I do think there's probably, I wish the press were here tonight, that we're sort of revealing it officially tonight in a way. Uh, but I assume in the next month or so we can roll it out in a more systematic way. And when you're ready to bring it back, uh, let's, let's have it with the, with the public input as part of that presentation. Absolutely. I'd I'm glad, make that motion. I'm glad Mayor Pro Tem pulled this because I, I had some concerns as well. Um, it was broadly supported at public safety, and I want to make sure we talk with, uh, with uh, Committee Chair Taylor, just to make sure he's on board with this. But I do agree that the, the assistance this will give us from a technology standpoint is wonderful, but we really do have to be careful in 2022 about how we roll this out and how the public feels mm -hmm. about its acceptance. The other questions that I have are, how many cameras will we need? I know the first year is free, but what's our ongoing cost? I know it's 2,500 bucks per year per camera. So before we fall in love with this thing, I'd love to know how many cameras we're gonna be looking at and what our ongoing costs are gonna be. Also, I think at the end of the pilot program, I think the item needs to come back to council for approval um, if it's below the threshold of us uh, of staff being able to write the contract. I think regardless of that, of what level that is, I'd like to see it back at council for, for approval. Right, absolutely. It was always the intention to come back before Good. council, let you all know the analytics, um, how things went, um, and, and make recommendations for next steps. Right. So I'm hearing that committee is okay with holding this for 30 days? I would, right. I would suggest however long it takes for them to get a public. Well, let's get a report in 30 days. Let's see we what, get a re see what an update, we'll look like get next an update month. See if we're days, but... ready to go, and if we're not, we'll we'll hold it. Yes. Again, thank you, Captain Chief. Sorry. Okay, that brings us to general agenda. Item G1: Presentation of the River Fire After Action Report. Good evening, Chief. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, members of the committee. Good evening. Good evening. Um, tonight, uh, I and Emergency Management Director Vernon and Kevin Dull is here. He's the President and CEO of EnviroSafe. Uh, we'd like to talk um, kind of in broad terms about findings, um, things we've learned um, following the, the Weaver fire. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about three primary things, and then um, I'm going to ask for a moment of personal privilege, if I may. Sure. Uh, if, I'm, if I may sort of set the stage here. <clears throat> this is, I'm tempted to call this a wrap-up session, but I don't believe it is. I think mm -hmm. it is 
a summation, but I think we need to keep the door open to things that we find as we go forward so that we're constantly looking for ways to to stay out of this because this was a black swan. This was something that nobody anticipated. So I think having that ongoing effort of being alert to things, to other potential things like this, it makes me not want to just put a put a bow on it and put it away. I, I would agree with that. I think that's a valid approach. Yes, sir. Uh, so the first thing um, I wanted to talk about was um, our decision to, uh, or and, and in this case, not to declare a state of emergency. That was that was a question. Um, and in hindsight, uh, Director Vernon and I have have both agreed that. And if we had to do it all over again, we would have made it a mandatory evacuation and we have, would have declared a state of emergency. Um, not that it, either one of those things would, I don't think, would have made any operational differences, but we would have done it and you could check those boxes and we could say that we did it and it would, those things would be in place for whatever purposes they may be needed. Um, at the time of the event, um, all, and August and I have been doing this collectively for almost 70 years. Um, and But I don't pretend, and I don't think he does either, to know everything. Um, but at the time of the event, um, to the best of our knowledge, declaration of a state of emergency would not have qualified us for any federal, any, any kind of state or federal resources now, to the best of our knowledge. Um, I do know that uh, declaration of a state of emergency gives law enforcement authority to go door to door, but in practice, nobody does that. Um, there, I, I was able to find one example of um, elected officials giving law enforcement a directive to go door to door and forcibly remove people ahead mm -hmm. of a storm. Uh, in a coastal community, and everybody uh, involved in that decision found themselves unelected at the, n the next time the, po the voters were able to go to the polls. Um, as it relates to mandatory versus voluntary, uh, there is no definition in North Carolina as to what a mandatory or voluntary evacuation is. Um, a mandatory evacuation does provide law enforcement with the authority to issue mi misdemeanor citations but again, nobody does that. There's no precedent that anybody has ever done that. Um, I remember being part of that discussion in the command post on the night of the fire. And my frame of reference for mandatory versus voluntary is for the first 20 years of my career where I you know, worked in municipalities east of here that are more susceptible to hurricanes particularly um, and in those communities, what they are communicating when they say a mandatory evacuation is if you have a problem and you do, if you do not evacuate and you have a problem, we are not going back to get you until the event is over. And, and I, again, I, that was my frame of reference. I remember being part of that conversation and that is not what I wanted to communicate to the citizens is that if you have a problem, we're not going back to get you. And we did not do that. We never stopped answering calls inside that one mile evacuation radius. Um, we set up a, a protocol with EMS where if there was a medical call, for example, in that one mile radius, we sent an engine company in, they got the patient, put them on the fire truck and took them out to the edge of that one mile evacuation radius and handed them off to EMS for treatment and transport. Um, so uh, again, I, I just, that was not, that, uh, that was what mandatory meant to me and I, that was not the message that I wanted to send to, to residents who did not evacuate. Uh, and turn, there was some, some discussion about the insurance app, uh, implications of mandatory versus voluntary. It does appear, it, it's not wholesale across the industry, but it does appear that some homeowners' policies will pay for what's kind of referred to as loss of use if the, a, a mandatory evacuation is declared. Um, Deductibles still apply, so I don't know how great the effect would be, but I will just say this. If there are residents who did not get a payout from their homeowner's 
policy missed out on some opportunity for reimbursement, I apologize and I will accept, I will accept responsibility for, for that happening. It was certainly not intentional and, and I will plead ignorance about the language of voluntary versus mandatory and what it means for kind of those loss of use clauses that may be included in some homeowners insurance. But policy. isn't that what our effort to compensate people was meant to fill that gap? The million dollars that we offered up. Uh, you're asking me a policy question, and I'm not a policy setter, sir. I'll ask Mayor Pro Tem that. I mean, wasn't that the, yes. the intent? Yes. Okay, thank you. The, the, uh, the, the last thing I would, would mention, and I, I would say, and I think uh, Mr. Dull is going to mention something about communications. Communications is always a challenge at an event like this. Uh, always has been and, and likely it, to some degree always will be. But I will say that some of the issues we experienced on January 31st have been resolved uh, by the fact that city fire communications transferred to the county on August 2nd. And I appreciate everybody sitting up here support on both sides uh, and seeing that that happened uh, because that has made some th has made a lot of things better and did address some of the issues that we had back in January. Now, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may have about three minutes of personal privilege. Um, we and that is the city of Winston-Salem has spent considerable time and effort responding to following up after the Weaver fire, discussing the Weaver fire in this and other, in other forums. Relatively speaking, fertilizer plant fires are not the fire threat in this country. They are not the fire threat in Winston-Salem or in the country. According to the Weaver representatives who were with us in the command post for the week of the fire, that facility was one of three in the country who did what they did or do what they did. And that is they were primarily in the, in the, in the business of making bulk custom blended fertilizer for tobacco growers, Christmas tree farmers, um, large you know, industrial type vegetable growing operations. That was the business that they were in. Um, the fire threat in America is from house fires. Three fertilizer plants that did what Weaver did. We have 350,000 house fires in this country every year. And three quarters of those are residential. And as you might draw the conclusion, 75% of Americans who die in fires every year die in residential house fires. From 2010 to 2019, the number of fires was down 3.2%. And the number of fires in America has been doing this, and you know, I'm drawing a very, you know, very slight down slope, but the number of fires in America has been going down slightly year over year for 40 or 50 years. What has changed is from that period from 2010 to 2019, the number of people who have died in fires in America is up over 24%. In the one mile evacuation area around Weaver, that one mile radius, for the five years prior to the Weaver fire, we have had 66 house fires. That's more than one a month. And I would tell you that I would wager, we, we won't ever be able to, to prove it, but I would wager that the products of combustion from those house fires were more toxic than what was released in the products of combustion from Weaver, and the products of combustion from those 66 house fires did more environmental damage than the products of combustion that were released from the Weaver fire. Because, and, and the reason more people are dying in fires in America now, the reason that number is up so much is because our homes now are about a thousand square foot bigger than our parents' homes. They have more open floor, floor plans. They are built of lightweight construction. And we have packed them full of polyester, nylon, vinyl, and polyurethane, things that began their lives at an oil well, and they burn like they came out of an oil well. Fire at America is a human behavior problem. 80% of the fires in this country are caused by some kind of human error. 
and we know how to fix that problem. We have known for decades how to fix that problem, and it is with residential fire sprinklers. And I would be proud to work with this committee, with public safety, with an ad hoc committee, to educate home builders, homeowners, inspectors, plumbers, et cetera, on the facts related to residential fire sprinklers. You would be hard pressed to convince me that the difference in price, and this, the homeowners always fight us about the price increase that residential fire sprinklers add to a home. The fact is they add about 1%. On a $200,000 house, you are talking about pennies a day over the course of a loan. And it is hard for me to believe that somebody who can afford a $200,000 house otherwise cannot afford it because their annual home, annual, annual home payment is two or $300 more. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will take any questions you uh, and Mayor Pro Tem or committee members have. I long for the days of $200,000 houses. Well, I was trying to be reasonable. <laughs> you made the math easy. Affordable. <laughs> Thank you. So questions for Chief. Chief, can um, fire, residential fire sprinklers be installed in existing homes? They can. The cost goes up from about a dollar or a dollar and a half per square foot when the house is under construction to seven or eight dollars a square foot after the house is built, the most opportune time to do it is while the house is under construction. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. <clears throat> Chief Mayo, you and your staff and the department, thank you so much for everything that you do every day, all day, 24-7, first off. Uh, going back to your statement or your comments on the state of emergency, I am quite sure that you and emergency management and police and everybody have heard my comments about the situation January 31st. Uh, as Councilman McIntosh said, this is something, this was an anomaly for all of us. And when I live, as you know, right around the corner from Weaver. I could see it all, the flames, the red. I could see it. I could smell it the whole time. I never evacuated. I told everybody I was like the captain on the uh, Titanic. I was going to go down with the ship, you know. Can't leave. Got to stay. But in my conversations, and I'm being transparent here, uh, with the city manager, city attorney, and some others, you know, I'm an elected official. I answer to the people that elected me. And I went to the FEMA training that the city of Winston-Salem won the grant. Uh, staff in the will tell you, I was very passionately instrumental in getting that money. I was on the phone every other day with FEMA and Homeland Security to get the training for Winston-Salem and for Scythe County. And we got the largest grant of any city in the country. Part of the deal was the uh, enactment of an emergency situation uh, bomb at the fairground, Truist Stadium, Bowman Gray, when you got thousands of people there, or hospitals, uh, trucks, trailers carrying explosives on 52 and 40, exploding and cutting us off from the rest of the world all simultaneously. And they talked about how important it was for elected officials uh, to be ready and available by uh, phone, cell, virtual, whatever, to weigh in on what is our action, what, what are we doing? versus not being a part of the process. And I came away after a week of that, with that in my head, and I still believe it, that we had a war room. Ms. August, Mr. Vernon was there. We had a war room. And uh, 
when this happened again, not because it happened and none of us had ever experienced it, and even as an elected official, it 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 took me a you know, it took my breath, just like yours and everybody else's. But I felt like as an elected official, when I got, you know, did my homework, had staff to do the homework, on a state of emergency per the state, per the county, per whatever, I felt like being the council member of that ward, that community, that I should have been able to weigh in on the decision. I thought uh, the whole council should have weighed in on the decision. We're the ones ultimately held responsible for anything, right, wrong, and different. And it's no personal, it's not personal, it's the business of the people with us. And when we have to answer as to why, you know, I couldn't give them a why. All I know is they said, well, didn't anybody ask you? Did anybody talk to you? I didn't, I didn't get a conversation. And did it kind of make me a little, what do you call it, sour? <laughs> They'll tell you I was sour. But again, that's not you. Again, I look to the management, the city manager, and our partner, the mayor, to have made that happen, even though it's not written. And immediately, an attorney and the manager would tell you that week, day two, I wanted to change, and I still want to change. I want it to be, and the council will have to weigh in on it, I'm just one vote. Anytime there is a crisis emergency situation, such as that level, hurricane comes in, like when we had the big storm in the 80s, that was one of those moments because our city basically was shut down for days, weeks. All I'm asking is that going forward, that the city council and the council member of the ward, whatever area that it is that we have a crisis that requires emergency responsiveness or any other resources that could have potentially or potentially harm life, human, property, whatever, that we have an opportunity to weigh in. That's all. That's all I'm saying. And that takes the burden off you guys. I mean, we're going we're gonna to take your subject matter expertise, and we're going to listen to it, just like we do everybody. We know you're the, the experts. We know you got all this experience. But at the end of the day, the public doesn't know that. All they know is they got an elected official, they got a mayor, they got a council. And I still, to this day, am asked, when I'm at a grocery store anywhere, why was, didn't you call for the state of emergency? I told them I didn't have an option. I didn't have the power. I didn't, but I did tell everybody, if I had had it or thought I could do it, I told her that. I told him that, that I would have done that. So I want you to know again, I thank you, I appreciate all of you emergency responders for putting your life on the line for the citizens of Winston-Salem. I couldn't ask for better. And again, if you hear in an undercurrent, because like you took your point of privilege, I'm taking mine, I want you all to understand. I appreciate you, treasure you, and this is nothing to do with you guys. It's the policy and the process that you don't have any control over. But I'm hoping that we will going forward, that we can help you all out in what you have to do and versus what we have to do. I just need to get that off my chest, Chief. Fair enough. I appreciate your support. And uh, for any role that I played in you getting crossways with your constituents, I apologize. From my standpoint, I don't think we could have asked for a better or more professional or more thorough physical response to the fire. Absolutely. I mean, I think that'll go down in local history. It will. It's already wait, there. <laughs> wait for it to be done. What this conversation is about is what we deal with all the time is how do you, how do you communicate complex ideas to a public that wants sound bites? And what's the best way to get buy-in, cultural buy-in, when you know all the answers, or you think you know all the answers, but you don't have the time or, or the, the capability to walk people through that, that process and right. how you got from here to here. 
you know, technology could be helpful. I think, you know, language barriers presented a, a potential problem. But yeah. you're, you're starting to sense what we get involved in all the time about why didn't you tell me this? And it's, it's really difficult. And there's not an answer to it. I think it's an ongoing process of learning and coming up with new solutions. Uh, but we need, to better, we need to better communicate across the board on everything we do. And that would be the only thing that I think could be looked at as could have been better in that, in that realm. Although we communicated. I mean, there was lots of news coverage and all that stuff. And things that were said were great. But, I mean, there were obviously lessons to be learned there um, that I think we'll learn. Yes. Um, we have a new communi communications director on their way in at some point soon. But that's something that needs to be drilled into them. They need to go back and look at the footage of this event and say, okay, you know, how do I how do we get this message across to our population um, in an effective manner? Um, you know, it ties back into broadband. You know, we don't have the ability to reach out to people electronically in, in a lot of cases. Um, but if we can enhance our ability to communicate electronically, I think that that goes a long way. Um, but again, I, I don't think anybody found any fault or mm -hmm. anything less than had any, anything less than very high praise for the way you guys handled. Um, so we're working on a, a zoning change um, that will keep another event like this from happening, although from what you're saying, uh, the chances of another event like that happening are extremely rare, but that's something we have to communicate to the public that we're doing. Um, and then beyond that, the, 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 the change in communications protocol, the way to look at, at this situation is something that we just all need to sort of bear down on and, and, and figure that out. Um, did any, do we want to hear from Mr. Vernon? Yeah, yes, sir. If if you if you will accommodate us, uh, Director Vernon's got a few remarks to make, Great. and then Mr. Dole as well. Great. And and if I may wrap up before I walk away, we are going to have other large events. I do not think it's going to involve almost 600 tons of ammonium nitrate, okay. but right. we are going to have other large events. Yes, yes sir. Indeed. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. For the comments and and the understanding and and the support. Great. We Thank you. It. Thank you, Chief, uh, Chairman, Mayor Pro Tem, Council Members. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, almost a good segue. What I thought I would do is just kind of briefly walk you through the response and hit on some of the highlights that uh, where we talk about the response and things that happened in, in, in an area where I saw some challenges. Um, so again, uh, and what I'm going to talk about, these steps that we would take, these highlights, we have used in past major incidents, and we're always preparing for the next incident, so we will have to use these again. So the, the first evening, the first hour of the fire, uh, and this was from my perspective, uh, myself and some of the team responded out, we established what is called an incident command post. And that is where the key agencies come together, and we're trying to make some decisions standing behind a vehicle in the middle of a grass field, and that's where the decision we had to make to, the hard decision with a, with a scenario of potential detonation to evacuate up to a mile. Uh, at that point, we very immediately scrambled and moved to a new incident command post. And I do need to thank uh, Fulps, the company Fulps that you did think also, they pretty much just allowed us to take over their business, uh, a multi-story building for an entire week up to having 120 people in that facility, and they gave it to us without question immediately, which was very helpful to us. We transitioned from that incident command post uh, because we had so many people showing up, so many agencies, to what you've heard us refer to as the Emergency Operations Center. Uh, we do have a fixed site here in the county and some backups, but for that event, that turned into the Emergency Operations Center. Uh, for that entire week. And again, I think we need to thank folks. Uh, we impacted their business by being there. Um, within hours of the incident, from my perspective, due to the size, scope, and scale of the event, I was on the phone with local, state, regional, federal partners, uh, our state emergency management team, uh, representatives from the governor's office. This obviously got a lot of attention, but considered very high impact. Um, so we did have a lot of great partnerships. I think it's important to note that. Um, that doesn't always happen, but it, it happened with that event for sure. We also established, and it's important to note, what is called a unified command, where we had the police department, the fire department, EMS, public health, 
all the different entities all working together, uh, trying to manage what was occurring, which was certainly a fast moving incident. I think it's important to note, we may have said this before, we've identified up to 44 different entities that were involved. And I can tell you now that's not all of them. I know we're missing folks. Also, there is a system called the mutual aid system you may have heard about before. And that is an agreement between agencies, departments to help each other across jurisdictional boundaries. With an hour or two of the incident, we had uh, response agencies from outside the city and even outside the county coming in to help us, and we would do the same for them if something happens tomorrow. Um, and that usually occurs when we exceed local resources. Uh, that's one of the definitions of a major crisis, and we certainly were exceeding some of the local resources that we had available to us. Uh, we've talked about messaging within minutes of the decision to evacuate. Once we could get mustered back up again, we started talking about messaging. Um, and we did that through social media by sending out police and fire, Going down streets, uh, we had several friends that lived in the area who talked about being scared to death by fire trucks going by and saying things, and, and certainly I can understand how that could be frightening. Uh, but again, messaging was uh, critical throughout the entire event, even when you sometimes didn't have a lot of information to share. Also, for the first time ever in Forsyth County, and I think in the Piedmont, we had to initiate what is called the wireless emergency alert system. When you get those weird flash flood warnings sometimes or a, uh, someone missing somewhere, we had to get the state to allow that and they agreed to it. Uh, so we set off that wireless emergency alert system again for the first time ever. Um, that was the first time we've ever had to request that. And we're, I'm still trying to find out exactly how many people that went to, but it was six to 10,000 cell phones uh, to tell people to evacuate and here's where you go for more information. So always messaging will be important in an event. Also, I think it's important to note, uh, we've gotten a lot of attention from across the United States about our use of drones. Uh, we have used drones in the past, but never before have we had to bring in nine different teams to run drones 24 seven, because that was really the only way we could get any snapshot of what was occurring. So we really thank those partners and uh, we really changed uh, some things in the drone world. People that are involved in drones have really taken a look at that. But due to the technology, even with the rain, fog, smoke, day or night, we were able to keep the drones up to give us an eye on what was happening. Probably one of the major challenges that uh, we tried to manage was what we call mass care or sheltering. Uh, within an hour of us making that decision to evacuate, when you say to evacuate, you have to provide resources to help those who don't have anywhere to go. Um, Obviously, and I'll tell you this now, we talked about hurricanes and ice storms. We will always suggest family, friends first, especially as we still continue to manage COVID. Um, but we did very quickly establish a location, almost a safe space is all it is at that point. When you're telling people to leave immediately, let's give them somewhere to go that's warm and dry. And uh, one of the challenges was usually when you open a shelter within a couple hours, you have an idea of how many people are coming. Is it 200? Is it nobody? Is it, is it 20? Uh, we have opened shelters in the past and no one shows up. Um, with this event, it went from 10 people to 70 people to no people to <coughs> 70 people, the next day to 10 people. Then for eight hours, there's no one. And then there were 12 people. And uh, so that, that really led to some challenges. Um, but where I think there was some hope in all the challenges with that, why we were people were not showing up or why they were leaving so quick, is so many community groups, volunteer groups, and churches, we had no idea we're stepping up and helping to pay people's hotel, bring them into the church, take them to their houses. There were even times we planned to go over to the shelter and they're like, there's nobody here. So we did have some challenges with sheltering and mass care and some of that was, there was no one there but we had to keep it open for the entire duration of that one mile evacuation zone being in place. Um, but again, I think it's important to note we had a lot of community step up and we would have probably had a lot more people in there, uh, but we didn't because of that community assistance. So, uh, but I think that's, that was one of the big challenges that we uh, really had to manage. So again, appreciate the opportunity and, and just remember those terms, the incident command post, EOC, unified command, mutual aid system, 
the things we talked about in Emmitsburg, Maryland, and we still talk about on a regular basis. Uh, so I appreciate the opportunity to come up and explain some of that. Uh, also, as a merge manager, I would be amiss if I did, not, I did not mention that this month is National Preparedness Month. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're always trying to put out our message to tell people to prepare for hurricanes, ice storms, earthquakes, uh, COVID, and everything else that can happen in today's uh, crazy world. So uh, for more information on that, you can go to Ready for Scythe or Ready NC for community preparedness, because I would rather people were prepared and we didn't have to respond then something happens and we're, we're scrambling to try to help people. Um, so do you have any questions for me right now? Many members, are others, any questions? Great, and one thing I think we can directly help with is use our social media presence to push that information out about preparedness and you know. Absolutely, and I, I will tell you personal experience, I was had people reaching out from out of state Yet we know some people who lived in that area who didn't know it even happened uh, mm -hmm. because they don't have TV and they don't have cell phones and things like that. So that we have a very broad, diverse community that we've got to try to figure out how to do messaging to for sure. If somebody on staff could just send a link of what you, if, if you'll choose what you think is best to share for us to share on social media and send us a link on that so we can propagate that out there, that'd be great. Councilman? Yes. Uh, again, thank you, Mr. Verna, for everything you do. and. Thanks for the week up there at the, in Maryland, Camp David. <laughs> when I tell people we were there, they don't believe me. But um, one thing that's uh, one of the good positives that came out of a bad situation for us in January 31st was the lack of communication to our Latino Hispanic community and others that I have been talking about for the past 10 years. How do we call ourselves a city when we only talk to maybe 70, 75% of us and the rest of us have to figure it out. What happened in the aftermath was, as a matter of fact, while I was at the uh, State of the Education meeting at the convention center today that the greater the chamber put on, a uh, young lady that was helping us get the uh, translators and people together uh, to communicate uh, to the Latino Hispanic community in that area. Um, also, uh, to help with the meetings, the community meetings that we were having, as well as the media. And uh, what I found out, she told me today, and again, it was a bad situation, but there's a good positive to it. She now has gotten started her own business and she now has contracts with the county, the, the school system, and all kinds of businesses because she said there was always a need, but nobody knew that the need was real until the Weaver Fire Mayor Pro Tem. She said, I know I'm thanking you and it's a bad way to thank you. She said, but you drove it home that we got to step up our communication in this city and looks like that we're doing that. So I'm glad that the city of Winston-Salem was on the forefront of, of helping to make that happen. So that's a good thing. Yes, ma'am. Um, well, if nothing else, I'm gonna invite up uh, sort of a guest of Chief Mayo and I, uh, Mr. Kevin Dole with EnviroSafe and I will let him uh, do a little more of an introduction. Thank you, welcome. If you would uh, let us know who you are. Good evening, committee members and council members. I'm Kevin Dahl, President and CEO of EnviroSafe Incorporated. Um, we are celebrating our 26th year of, of doing this type of work. We're a crisis and risk management firm. And throughout the years, we've done numerous after action reviews of major incidents across the country and in, also in Canada. And this is not the first after action uh, review that we've done for your jurisdictions. Um, to be more specific, we have done an after action report for the Weaver Fire for uh, emergency management, also the Winston-Salem Fire Department, and then separately Wake Forest University. So I have two areas that I'd like to, um, to talk to you about and, and, and share information. When we get asked to do these reviews, our group is made up of subject matter experts that's been in the field for a number of years, and we get the appropriate um, subject matter experts on a particular project. In this case, you had a fertilizer fire. 
They review data such as response data. Uh, we conduct one-on-one -on -one interviews. We look at uh, response records. And also we have a um, after action conference to where all the agencies are invited to. And we facilitate that. And throughout the process, we collect data. And we look for trends, themed trends that we, um, that we, um, that we search for when we're doing an after action review of a major incident. So first off, I want to share some of the major takeaways of those trends that we've seen that, that um, our subject matter experts brought to light that this is something that uh, should be included in an after action report. One, you had good collaboration between local responding agencies and state and federal agencies. Uh, we followed this incident, most major incidents that um, are certainly newsworthy. Um, our company follows those. Um, it's a good chance that we might be involved in the, the surveys afterwards, so we do follow those. I will say the, the media, from just the media standpoint, it was, it was a well-covered um, event um, that you had here in, in Winston-Salem, and it, it had a positive light on the response, because we look at it from the response um, um, component. You also had good communities um, support, and such as Fulp Environmental, you had food donations, and I think you actually had some hotels for sheltering. So that's one thing we don't see in a lot of jurisdictions is the good community support. Um, the times that we've done work here um, in Winston-Salem and Forsyth County proper, uh, that's one thing that we see continuously is the, the community support that you have with your public safety groups. Uh, you had good use of various subject matter experts. I think you had a subject matter expert on uh, the particular product that was of concern um, that, that came down from another state and participated in, at the EOC to help with some of the decision making on um, next moves for the event. The city's marketing department uh, provided excellent support on multiple communication platforms. There are gaps related to foreign language messaging and the city's ability to communicate with residents over a wide area without overloading 911 lines. And I think that's already been shared um, tonight to some degree. Fire and EMS did an excellent job in coming up with a plan to remove patients from what we call the hot zone, the area that um, is of concern from an environmental standpoint during the event. They come up with an excellent, um, innovative way to answer EMS calls um, in those areas. So that was, um, that was something that was seen by our um, subject matter experts as being something noteworthy to include. Um, I would suggest, and it was um, shown, we always look back to, sorry, always look back to see what exercises. We do a lot of exercises also across the country. We've done several exercises in this jurisdiction, so I would continue the top-down support for regular exercises involving, of course, all your public safety groups, but also groups like your traffic um, field operations, public transit, utilities, et cetera. That's something that even though they might or might not be involved um, directly with an incident, if you have one of magnitude of the Weaver fire, they certainly will be um, utilized during those events. So if they're included in exercises that you have, that is um, something that is of a positive um, outlook when, they're when they have to respond to an incident. Um, as Mr. Vernon mentioned, the drone program, this is one of the largest deployments of a drone um, um, initiation in the state. Um, it was, we have been working with some of the units, uh, some of the drone units across the state, and the state itself, uh, in North Carolina Emergency Management, is working on typing these type of, of drone response uh, groups. This was kind of a test run, if you will. Um, there were some lessons learned in that, and we've actually taken a look more detail in that, but I will share with you that um, that needs to have uh, more um, definition, it needs to be more defined on how that, um, those response agencies would be involved. I think you had nine to come in across from the state. Um, that's not been done in North Carolina. However, the information that was uh, delivered by these drone programs were um, invaluable. For, for your response. We, we did actually review some of the drone footage and we could see clearly if um, you were in a command situation that data would be very helpful as it turned out to be. The second part I'd like to share with you really just overarching items that uh, we look at at, at every um, incident review that we, um, that we review. And it was mentioned, um, I think, by the chief and also August that communication is always the number one problem, always. Um, it doesn't matter where it is and what jurisdiction, what state, um, even in Canada, it is a problem. In exercises that we do across the country, communication is always the number one problem. I will say in the event that you had here, you overcome a lot of those problems, which is, is um, hats off to your agencies for that. The one thing I would um, uh, mention is 
your emergency operations center, I think for the event that um, happened at the Weaver fire, you had to outfit an actual EOC. Uh, jurisdiction should, and it's highly recommended, to have a fully turnkey functional EOC ready to activate in an event. Hurricanes, it's much easier to, to prepare for, right? You have some, you have some um, notice that you've got an impending event coming your way. In this case, you really need to have where you can turn an EOC and turn it open very quickly. So one thing that we um, included in the report is to take a look at the um, EOC capabilities for your county and your city. I do know you have an EOC, I've been in your EOC, but is it turnkey ready to go? That's just something to consider um, that has really taken hold across, I know across North Carolina, we were recently doing an exercise in Anson County, very rural county, um, down in Waysboro area, and they have a state-of-the-art EOC. That's one of the things they put a lot of emphasis on. It's a turnkey ready to go EOC. So something to, um, to think about. Also, as a, as, a, as a theme and response that we kept seeing um, is overall review of hum, human resource and capital outlay uh, should be reviewed both for the Winston-Salem Fire Department and also for South County or Winston-Salem for South County Emergency Management. This should include asking questions about what is the adequate staffing for a jurisdiction such as Winston-Salem and its fire department properly staffed regard to positions. That is also true for the EM group and adequate staff for proper planning in response to large hazard material incidents such as the Weaver fire. Again, um, something that we do not do, we do not do those type of studies, but it is something we've seen as a theme as we continued with the, the um, um, analyzing this event for many months that is one area that should be um, looked at. Um, as I mentioned before, and I won't um, go over it again for sake of time, you do need a turnkey fully equipped and secure EOC to be able to respond to incidents of this nature um, that you don't have proper um, notice, such as a hurricane. Fully functional mobile command post is something that is uh, inherently needed as well. Um, I think you do have some mobile command post in the county city. I know you had to bring in some mutual aid uh, from other counties um, with a mobile command post or a mobile command unit. That is something that uh, we would recommend and have in the report that you take a look at and work with your public safety agencies on exactly what's needed there. The key in these type of events is, again, hurricanes, much easier, right? We have time. The key is to have everything ready to go when you have an event like this that supports your public safety agencies that use equipment day in and day out, fire apparatus, EMS units, et cetera. But that mobile command post sitting on the side, it needs to be fully equipped, ready to go at a moment's notice, just like a, your EOC. Then the sheltering function, um, um, just finishing up our, our oversight here of, of what we looked at with the report, is the sheltering. Your sheltering function, mass care, as, as Mr. Vernon mentioned, needs to have um, very lines of delineation who is in charge of that and who is um, operating that. That's, that is a mass care and sheltering, I will say, is something that comes up on every item that we do, for the most part, if it's an event that we review that requires evacuation, um, and also sheltering. That is one area that's very difficult, um, but something to take a look at. I think that's already been recognized um, when we started doing our reviews. I think it's already been recognized as something work in progress, if you will, uh, for your jurisdiction. To finish up, I will just say I've worked with several, um, done, have worked several exercises within your jurisdictions over the years, and every time the participating agencies strive to work together with common goal of providing the best possible response to very challenging incidents. I will say Winston-Salem for South County is one of the counties that I can say across any time I go anywhere um, to do these reviews, I always use Winston-Salem for South County as an example of how they always look for an improvement plan after a major event. Um, you don't see that in a lot of jurisdictions. They just hope it doesn't happen again and they, they go on and continue their, their business. Your jurisdiction seems to always want to do better and that is through having third parties to come in and to review the, the response. I, hats off to you for allowing that to take place. It needs to be done more and more across jurisdictions to improve the response. That's what you're here for to do. Um, as policymakers, as public safety officials responding to these, they want to do the best they possibly can. And the way you do that is look and see, obviously, what went right and continue doing that. But what did, what did go wrong? Step up and, and, and look at what did go wrong and let's fix it. You know, it might take training, it might take human resources, it might take capital outlay, but whatever the case, bring it before groups such as yours 
and be able to take a look at it and do what you can do to improve. That's what we're all trying to do, especially in the public safety field. And that's what we as a company try to do uh, with jurisdictions is take a look at what went well, take a look at what didn't go so well, and step up and try to make it better next time for, for your citizens. This was a very challenging incident. Um, I used to work years ago in public safety, and I was in, the, I was in position of, of Chief Mayo. I've been in a position of Mr. Vernon during big events. It is a challenging event. You had a very challenging event here in Winston-Salem. And I took special notice, because originally I'm from Clemens, North Carolina, so um, I took special notice when anything happens here, um, and this place is dear to my heart, certainly. But it was a very challenging incident, and our perspective is your response agency really did a phenomenal job with what she was working with. You, could, you had a potential major, major incident on your hands. You had a major incident on your hands, right? It was potentially that could go much worse. But what these public agencies did in our review, we see that they prepared for that. That's so what one thing we always look for, did they prepare for what could have happened? Or did they just get lucky, right? In this case, they prepared for that. We were very impressed by how they prepared for that. And it was proven in, in our review with our group. So hats off to this group, all the committees that support the public <laughs> safety agencies. They need to continue support and uh, Mayor Pro Tem, I think I'm, I'm right on that. Um, your support is, is, is certainly um, important and I'm, I, it just, it, it really warms me to come and hear that about our first responders because they do do a phenomenal job. And here, I'll just end up saying, they do an extraordinary job wanting to improve. Mm. I will say that is not in most jurisdictions. I wish it was. Here it is. So you have a model in place for improvement, for continuous improvement for your citizens throughout. So I thank you for your time. Uh, we enjoy doing all these reviews because all we're trying to do is just help. Yeah. So with that, I'll entertain any questions that you might have. Um, otherwise, I'll step away and, and respect the rest of your time. Thanks for your report. Thank any questions you. from committee members or council? All right, sounds like um, you've detailed some things that we need to look at, um, and I'm sure staff will uh, bear down on those and, um, and address them with full vigor. So appreciate the report, and it's always nice to have an outside view um, of what you think is a really good you know, operation, but it's good to have eyes outside our organization come in and sort of reassure us. Okay. Thank you so much. Is there any, anyone you. else that's... Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Anybody else to speak on the subject? All right, with that, have I got anything from committee or, or council that um, we would like to discuss about this item now um, in light of my earlier statement about this not being closing the book on it, but um, at least a chapter of it? I agree. Okay. All right. Nothing further. Then uh, wrap us up for tonight. So uh, if no one objects, we're adjourned. Thank you.